So what we can do with CRISPR is doing this cut in a very efficient way. But repairing this cut is not anything that has to do with CRISPR. This is something nature has created and we haven't really interfered with that yet. So my name is Simone Spuler and the differences to Roland's talk will be that um, we see patients and we do experiments, but when we need computers, we need the help of people like Roland. And um, the, the good thing about the Max Delbrück Center is that on this campus, we really can get help in all of the aspects we need for our, for our work. Um, so I'm going to talk about gene editing and muscular dystrophies and about um, talking about clinical application of CRISPR-Cas and about gene editing is a narrow path. A narrow path because we need to, well, let you know what motivates us to keep on working on that and also at the same time not to raise too two big hopes of how fast things really will be um, translated into clinics. Okay, so um, these are different organs and in the middle there are patients and um, people can, can um, get diseases and these are about 6,000 different inherited diseases. I'm talking about gene, gene de um, <coughs> mutations and um, all of these organs you can see here, these are organs where many, many thousands inherited diseases are possible but at the same time these organs can be transplanted. So I'm married to a very skilled surgeon, he is not a transplant surgeon, but still I know that the advances of transplant surgery are enormous and so these, uh, these um, diseases that are caused by, by genes that cause um, problems in these organs might be cured just by organ transplants. And you have heard about the Norwegian princess, um, Mette, who has, is suffering from a lung disease, Niki Lauda, who has just received a lung transplant, and our, our president, Steinmeier, who gave his kidney to his, to his wife. So these, these are problems that can be cured. Now, look at muscle. Skeletal muscle is all over the place. We swallow and we look around with our muscles and we, we walk and we run and we, we eat and we do all kinds of things. We need these muscles and skeletal muscle cannot be transplanted. So by, by thinking about gene editing, it's very important to keep in mind that there is skeletal muscle, a very important organ where we need to think about you know, how can we reach a, a scissor, a, a, a tool to, to, um, to repair every single cell of skeletal muscle because there is no way to transplant. Okay, so there are man, many, many muscle wasting disorders um, and some of them are acquired and um, muscle cachexia, how, how it's called, or muscle wasting is part of everybody's aging process. We have heard about aging quite a bit today. Um, but it's also a part of severe illnesses like cancer, what we have heard um, before. And um, if, you, if people are on intensive care for, for a prolong <coughs> prolonged period of time, um, there is muscle wasting um, in addition to their underlying illness. Um, and then there is a large group of um, diseases that are called muscular dystrophies. Muscular dystrophies are um, caused by monogenetic mutations in certain genes and they, they cause, and this is illustrated here in this patient, they cause atrophy in all muscles that, um, that are everywhere and they are also affecting the respiratory muscles like the diaphragm so the patient is on, on permanent respiratory support and the patient is in the wheelchair. And then there are also developmental failures where only small muscles are not built as they are supposed to do. The group of muscular dystrophies, although you may know that only Duchenne's muscular dystrophy really makes it to the press, but, um, but indeed um, herit hereditary muscular dystrophies um, consist of a large group of several of many um, different genetic disorders. And here we are talking about 171 that have been described 
until today. And, and the, the number of these diseases is raising even further with new, um, new methods like, like next generation sequencing. So for all of these different disorders, although they are rare by itself, but all of them together, they are not that rare. And so there's one of in, in 250 to 500 people who is affected by a muscle disorder, by any of these. And for none of them, any cure is possible in the moment. And now there's CRISPR, and CRISPR promises well, this can all be changed. So we have these 170 diseases, and there is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy making it into the press all the time. I think this is going on for 30 years, and I could, I could talk for an hour about the, the huge progresses that have been made in research on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, but still until today, there's not a single patient that has been, that has been treated. And I would like to explain to you the, differ the difficulties of that, and also why CRISPR, although it's great, um, is still not, not the sole solution to, to solve the problems. So CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is a, um, a possibility to target a certain, certain spot in the genome. And uh, this is illustrated here, so you have a 20, 20 base pair sequence, which is a guide sequence, which allows to, uh, to target a certain, certain spot in, in the double-strand DNA. And then this, there needs to be another sequence close by, which is PUM. And if this doesn't happen, if there is no PUM, then it doesn't work anyway. So this is just a technical problem, but quite relevant in, in practical terms. And um, then there is this scissor, which is a protein an enzyme called um, Cas9. And with this together, you can cleave the DNA on a certain spot. This is very nice. Okay, so we heard before, um, so there is uh, somatic chromosomes, we have a maternal and a paternal copy of each of these chromosomes. And so just um, selecting two of these chromosomes, I would like to walk you through some of the aspects we need to consider when we want to do a CRISPR repair. Okay, so homozygous mutations. Homozygous mutations happen if the same mutation is on the maternal and on the paternal chromosome. And this is not usually the case in, in, in the um, mid-European culture, then we have different types of, of mutations, which I come back later. But um, here in homozygous mutations, these mutations, here illustrated in yellow, are located on identical spots on both chromosomes. And when we design one of these wonderful scissors, the CRISPR Cas9 scissor, then we can cut these mutations and very exactly find these mutations on the chromosome in the right gene. And sometimes these, these scissors may end up on other chromosomes and cut on the wrong places. These are called off-target problems, but off-target um, events, but I'm not going to talk about these, although these really create problems as well. So these mutations can be found and cut by CRISPR-Cas9 method. What results is a double-strand break. So if there is a double-strand break in a chromosome, this is really a problem for a chromosome. And so the chromosome might just be degraded, and this is a problem for life. So there are mechanisms in, in nature, in the cell, that, um, that just take care of that, because this is a huge problem. And um, so we, we want to repair that. And this is where CRISPR stops. So what we can do with CRISPR is doing this cut in a very efficient way. But repairing this cut is not anything that has to do with CRISPR. This is something nature has created and we haven't really interfered with that yet. So there are sub two, two ways how, how nature deals with these cuts we make now artificially by CRISPR-Cas9. So there is like an emergency repair. Oh, the chromosome is cut, we need to do something with that. Very, very important, and so there is quite an emergency repair. Like you get guests and your, your, your chair is broken and you run down in your cellar and you need to get another chair. So this is what you do, emergency repair. And then there is something else which is called the master repair, and this is a very exact thing. So you go to the, to the handyman and the handyman does everything really nice and new again. So the emergency repair, is like, like this. So you just 
it's a it's a plaster and you just um, cover the wound and that's fine and we call that NHEJ non-homologous end joining and that is the name for the homo um, <coughs> the the um, emergency repair it's very nice for basic scientists to, ha to know about this mechanism. And when you know that this is a very sloppy repair, then you know that your gene is really put together again after the double strand break. But still, because it's so sloppy, you can still put it together again, but still not have a functional gene. So for making knockout mice, knockout cells, knockout whatever, it's really great to have this NHEJ, the non-homologous end joining. But for doctors, it's not really helpful, not, not really. So here we would like a master repair, because if you take out the mutation, and if you have a mutation, then you want to repair the mutation, and in a right way, and not in a very sloppy way, because then you just create a different disease, and it's still the same problem for the patient. So here we are talking about HDR, HDR is um, homologous directed um, repair and what it means is that you have to have a template and you have to put the template efficiently into the cell to the right spot. And this is how it looks. So you have your template and you create this and then you just hope that your template will find the way and just integrate into the right spot in the right direction. Well, templates don't really do that very efficiently. Um, and, and so, you know, these templates, although I, I draw them now all in the same direction, but they switch and they turn around and they just don't like to go to the right spot. And this is really a problem and it's extremely inefficient, you know, to work or to, to hope that HDR is going to happen. And then we have the real problem in daily medical life with patients. So we do not always deal with homo <coughs> homozygous mutations. We deal with compound heterozygous mutation. What does this mean? It means that one mutation comes from mother and one mutation comes from father and they are at the different locations on the gene. And now you have to create two of your wonderful CRISPR-Cas9 scissors. And this might work this is not, today it's not really the problem anymore to create these efficient scissors. But what is a problem? To get the templates into the right spot. And now we have to create two different templates. And the two different templates, they are supposed to go into the right spots and to find the right cut and to not switch around and to not twiggle. And so they, this is what, what we want to do when we talk about um, repairing muscular dystrophies. This is not all of the problem, I'm just, just a few of them. Okay, so the, the idea is, because we don't want the NHEJ, we don't want non-homologous end joining to happen in our cells, so we would like to enhance HDR, because HDR is the efficient thing. And HDR so should be like um, the focus, and we would like to eliminate the NHEJ, but in cells, cells do what we all do. When it's easy, we just go for it. And so this is, this is what happens in the cell much more often than this one, unless, unless we have um, dividing cells. And not just dividing cells, but rapidly dividing cells. So we, which cells in the body are rapidly dividing? Well, there are these wonderful iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. They rapidly divide, and this is true for embryonic life. There are other cells where, where we can talk about dividing cells, and even in adult life, and this is hematopoietic um, cells, there is gut epithelium, which is rapidly um, and, and constantly regenerating. There are, and there are, small organ-specific stem cell populations. They exist in liver, they exist in pancreas, they in exist in brain, and they also exist in muscle. But the, usually the main, main mass of muscle, this consists of post-metotic non-dividing cells. And this is true for muscle, brain, heart, liver, and, and pancreas. So we are facing a situation where we would like to have a lot of HDR happening after we made our exact cut using CRISPR-Cas, but this HDR is simply not happening in the cells where we are interested in liver, brain or muscle, and I'm interested in muscle. 
Okay, so, so we, we want to look at cells that can be targeted by CRISPR-Cas and what we do then, just we, we also like to have some, some a little bit of successes in these, in these efforts. So we make um, iPS cells from primary myoblasts and this is an example. So here we have primary human muscle stem cells and they have a lot of, um, they, they um, express the myogenic markers, PAC7, MyoD, MIF5 and Desmin and these myogenic markers, they disappear after we um, de-differentiate them into, into um, iPS cells and then all the so-called Yamanaka factors come up which are negative here in our primary cells. So in iPS cells, when we apply our, our CRISPR scissors, this is really nice and these are wonderful experiments and they of course they motivate us and here you can see that we complete that we can show a complete correction even of a compound heterozygote mutation in iPS cells so here you can see this in alpha sarcoglycan gene a G2A point mutation and here you can see the two alleles from mother and father and um, here in the in the after repair we have a complete 100% repair of this of this mutation in iPS cells well unfortunately we can't really go to the patient and say we are very close to 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 um, treating you because we are not and this is for the reasons i i was talking about but then there is um, another population in, uh, there is a population in muscle which um, are primary muscle stem cells or so-called satellite cells. And this is a very small population consisting of about two to three percent of all nuclei that are present in skeletal muscle. They have these stem cell properties. And satellite cells is what, how they are called and these satellite cells are located between the basal lamina and the sarcolemma. And the satellite cells are responsible that, that skeletal muscle can regenerate very effectively even until um, older age. And what happens here in a modular way, when there is an injury to skeletal muscle, then these satellite cells, they get activated, they proliferate, and they, um, they um, fuse with the, the existing um, muscle fiber, make new muscle, and after two weeks, so it's a very efficient and very quick process, um, after two weeks you can have an intact mature muscle fiber again with a replenishment of the satellite cell niche. And of course this is regulated in a highly complicated molecular matter um, and um, among which many many molecules describing the surface of the satellite cell and also the transcription factors are present but here I would just point out that PAC7 defines these satellite cells probably best. And these satellite cells, they, they are dividing, so they might be a target for, eight, for successful HDR, and this is why we focused our work for the last years very much on these satellite cells. Um, and satellite cells, although they are, have been known for quite a while, it's, um, they have not been, been successful in, in being used for clinical trials, and why is that? So when you isolate these satellite cells and you put them in tissue culture and you hope for these satellite cells to, to divide, and they do divide rapidly, which is nice, but then they also, they grow older, and they, they grow older and then they die. Either they die in senescence or sometimes they fuse, if they are too close to each other, they fuse to become myotubes and become more closely to real skeletal muscle and then they fuse and they also die. So this is the, the fate of a satellite cell in culture and what we um, did in the last years is to, to develop a method where we can um, divide satellite cells for many, many, many passages and keep them keep them young, so without any Yamanaka factor. So what we do, we just put them in the cold. So this would be an alternative for all of us. Instead of inhaling Yamanaka factors, we maybe just go into the cold for, for a while. And so what we, see <laughs> what we see here is that when we place these fiber fragments from adult, um, adult muscle into the cold for a week, then we can get very robust, very nice and very proliferating and in, in a way quite young satellite cells. And they are 100% Desmond positive, meaning that they are all myogenic. No other cell type is able to survive this harsh treatment. So we have um, no fibroblasts and no endothelial cells 
and nothing else contaminating them. And so on these cells we can work and with these cells we have a safe cell type that can only become muscle and not become a car carcinoma or other tumor where we can try to do our effective HDR. And um, this is our strategy, what we are doing in the moment and how we, how we want to tackle muscular dystrophies. And I hope that at some point we will start a first clinical trial in humans. So just to summarize this, we start with a patient, we, we take muscle biopsies from a patient where we isolate these muscle stem cells. In right now, we go through iPS cells to do the gene editing because going directly to the to the gene repair and primary myoblast is something we are just optimizing in the moment. And then we would like to take these corrected myoblasts after talking to all the regulatory agencies back to the patient. Um, in addition, we also um, have, have developed several humanized mouse models, humanized me being humanized meaning that we took out the, the mouse gene and replaced it for the human gene and so that we can work with the same guide RNAs in the cells as well as in the mouse models. And here we can, we can um, um, put the, the guide RNAs into, um, into cargo like AAV viruses or other, other molecules and then maybe go back to the patient directly. Okay, and this is my group, and we are all working on the same subject, um, all focusing on bringing this to the patient with all the difficulties I have talking, talked about to you. And um, yeah, here I would like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.